an Olympian <laughs> twice. Yeah. You really need to, to choose your people carefully in, in this sport, definitely. Does it get lonely sometimes? Yeah, it does. It does, it gets lonely even on the court. You can have 10 people in your box, but still you are going there alone and you're competing alone. And honestly, I'm not the best in mental preparations. I still have a lot of work to do. I so right, all of us have yeah. to extreme improve Yeah, definitely, yes. that's a good thing. If you're a tennis coach, you first of all need to be a good psychologist, at least that's what I think. And I would prefer Olympics to anything in the world. You know, for me, winning gold would be the, the, the top of my career, even if I never win a Grand Slam. Ready and welcome to Foreign Influence. We are there to interview Alex Krunic, who represents Serbia. She is in Melbourne for the Australian Open. Alex, thank you so much for being a guest on our show. Thanks it's, for having me. It's such a pleasure to welcome you thank in you. Melbourne for the Melbourne Tennis. Thank you for having me here and I'm definitely happy to come back to Australia and uh, my favorite Grand Slam. Where were you born and what memories do you have of your childhood? I was born in Moscow, in Russia, and uh, obviously I have a very, very cold memories and snowy. I was born in 1993. Uh, my parents moved there to work. My father works there. My mom, they are still there. I started practicing when I was four with an older man, uh, Alexander Petrovich. He used to train a couple of uh, metro stations away from where we lived. And uh, it was my first experience with, with sports in general and tennis. And at the age of seven, he told us that he thinks he cannot help me further and that uh, I should seek for a, a better and a bigger uh, tennis school, which happened to be Spartak. Uh, and in Moscow. Yes, in Moscow. And uh, Obviously, you were showing a lot of potential yeah. and he must have been extremely impressed. Well, I'm not sure I was showing you know, at age of five or, or six, but I was a very active kid. And um, at, the, at the age of seven, we went to Spartak uh, in Moscow and... Uh, I was picked by my first coach, Eduard Safonov, and that's basically how my tennis journey started. Uh, and before that, when I was three and a half, four, my, uh, my late grandparents uh, gifted me um, a sponge ball and a plastic racket, and that's when I started hitting all the uh, decorations and flowers at home. So my <laughs> mom decided that it's safer for her and for me to, to play elsewhere. So that's basically, that's my first step into tennis. That's how I can say. Incredible. But you were born into a multicultural family, is that right? Both of my parents are Serbian, actually. Oh. Yeah, so my, my father, he went to Russia for the university. He graduated there, then he came back to Serbia. And then he met my he mother. Study? Where did he study? He studied in economy in Plihanovski, in uh, in university, so when he came back to Serbia, he met my mom, then he got the job again in Russia, so they moved. So they kept coming back to Russia, basically. Fantastic. So it was yeah. So I went to Spartak, uh, I started playing there, and I played there for more than 10 years. Uh, Did you have to combine school, yes. like ac academic subjects yeah, and sport? Must have been really tough. Yeah, I was attending a normal Russian basic school where uh, I didn't have a lot of freedom, uh, unfortunately. And uh, the Russian school system is very strict. Because it's very demanding. Yeah, it's very demanding. And um, we found some way here and there. I was picked up by my mom at around 12 after uh, four classes. And then uh, she drove me in uh, Moscow traffic to, to practice. I um, ate my lunch in the car. In the car. Yeah, and I practiced my first practice. Then I did um, my homework in between two practices, then the second one, and then uh, dinner in the car again on the way back home. And sometimes it took two, three hours, you know, how it can be in Moscow traffic. Yeah. So 
it wasn't easy, but when I was a bit older, uh, like 10, 11, I could already travel myself by metro. So, and Moscow subway is beautiful. It is, so, uh, it is like a museum. Yeah, like so a museum, many marble yeah. sculptures. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's pretty safe. Uh, so that's, that's when uh, it was a bit easier for my mom, but then my sister started playing, so she was driving her. So mm -hmm. she was the driver for 10 years. So you were a tennis family. Yeah, well. Were your parents athletic? Not really. I mean, my father played a bit of basketball in, in, in his university and my mom played a bit of volleyball, but nothing. They weren't professional or they didn't even play for the university properly. So they're, they come from... What was your mom's profession? Uh, she's an economist as well. So they're working in the same, uh, same company, uh, same company even. So wow. they're nowhere near the sport, which, which is good because I never had that kind of pressure of you know, their um, expectations. I'm lucky in, in definitely in that perspective. At what point did you decide to do tennis professionally? I think Spartak was uh, definitely uh, where my mind started going that way. When I was 12 or 13, we traveled a lot with my coach and uh, I was winning basically everything. I was winning everything in Russia, everything in Serbia. I was number two in Europe, so... So how old were you at that time? 12 or 13, 12, I that think, young. something like that. Yeah, 13 maybe. So that's when I really started taking tennis very seriously and I was a very competitive kid in everything. I think that's the age where I really thought that this is something I really want to do, not for a living, but um, that was my passion yeah. and it still is. I think that's when it started and then at the age of obviously 17, 18, Actually, at 16, maybe I had to make a decision whether I want to go to college. States, yeah. I was receiving a lot because of offers. Because that's the time when you finish high school yeah. in Russia. Yeah, 15, 16. I got a lot of offers from, from the USA to play in college, and it was very interesting. And, of course, I spent some time thinking, but uh, I, I wanted to continue professionally and try, try myself in professional waters. So I'm glad that... Uh, I made that decision. But you that's, followed your dream. Yeah, definitely. I followed my dream, my passion, and uh, I definitely made the right decision. And um, yeah, I'm happy that you know I had this opportunity to to make a choice because some players they make a choice to go to college because they they financially cannot keep trying to to be professional. So I'm definitely lucky in that way. We're back with Foreign Influence, I'm Elena Reddy and we're speaking with Alex Krunich who is in Melbourne for the Australian Open. What is the life like on the tennis circuit? It because depends. you have to travel all the yeah. time and the training sessions yeah. and time zone differences. Yeah, it's, it's demanding. You definitely have to sacrifice a lot or maybe not sacrifice but that's the price you pay. You don't spend a lot of time at home. Can't be, at least in my case, I always suffered emotionally that I cannot be a proper sister, uh, daughter, granddaughter, friend, you know, because I can't um, spend too much time uh, with my people physically. And I also, you know, cannot think too much about uh, everyone else's problems, even if I really do. And I, I try to be there for people, but it's very tiring. And in tennis, you need to be 100% mentally in it. And uh, of course, traveling time zones, it's, I mean, it's, it's very tiring physically. You have to think about a lot of things and you're never more than two weeks in one place. So at one point, I think everyone gets to the point where you just get tired of it. You know, it's, it's a nice life and people see on the TV, they see, you know, all this uh, luxury and uh, money and trophies and contracts and everything but it's definitely everything but that that's the top of the of the iceberg but everything else is hard who travels work. with you a team obviously depending on what you can afford but i travel with my coach and i sometimes take my physio so that's um, that's my bubble in a way there's a lot of people around us network. yeah my support network definitely there's a lot of people around us you have agents you have a bunch of people and it's it's not always perfect you know there's a lot of people that want to get a piece of a pie you know and then the piece of fame 
to you and with your help. So you really need to, to choose your people carefully in, in this sport, definitely. Does it get lonely sometimes? Yeah, it does. It does. It gets lonely even on the court. You can have 10 people in your box, but still you are going there alone and you're competing alone. And you're often, in the battle. Yeah, you are, with you're yourself. a warrior. Yeah, you have to be a warrior. You're, you're alone there and definitely uh, you definitely feel lonely, especially if you have people around you that, that are there when you win. But when you lose, a lot of people uh, seem to just you know, walk away and uh, they don't want to be a part of a struggle. They only want to be a part of, of celebration. The, so. the winning way. Yes, yeah. yes. So, okay. And you are there regardless. You have yeah. to be on court and if you lose, you lose. It's on you. You know, you, you, want, you can't blame anyone. So that's the tough part. What is your most favorite city to play in? I love Melbourne. Not because I'm here. Yay! Lucky <laughs> no. us! I really love Melbourne. I, I always told uh, my friends that it's my favorite Grand Slam, definitely. What makes it your favorite? I like the atmosphere. People are chill and they, are, they seem happy to me. Everything is easy here. Um, they try really hard. They love their Grand Slam. I love how much crowd we always have, how many people come. So I feel like it's a part of the culture and, you know, we're not somewhere away from the city. We're in the city. We're a part of everything a part of the whole atmosphere and energy so i just i guess it's the energy i love about it i it's one of the worst grand slams for me performance wise i never played well here but i always love to come back here so how is tennis playing on different surfaces an obvious difference where clay is slower grass is faster but uh, physically for us it's tougher because uh, when you go on grass you have to stay lower with your legs Clay, the ball bounces higher, so sometimes you get some shoulder pain, you have longer points. Mm -hmm. um, clay uh, matches are longer than, than the rest. And you have different balls used on those surfaces. Some are uh, heavier, some are lighter. So it also depends what you prefer. For me, heavier balls are tougher to play with because I'm small. Mm -hmm. For the big hitters, it's easier. So there is a lot of nuances and different things that people don't see but we really uh, feel them. And there's a lot of, unfortunately, much more injuries on grass. Okay. Yeah. And who is your most memorable opponent that you played against? I don't know. I, to I, these days. Yeah, I guess it's Petra Kvitova. Why I mean, is that? Yeah, that was one of the nicest wins of my career back in 2014 at the US Open. I think she was number two back then, I can't remember, but she was a Grand Slam champion and she was obviously someone I looked up to and um, she was huge then and I was a girl coming from Qualis, trying my, my best. So it must have been very encouraging for you, like and yeah. must have give, empowering. Yeah, it gave me a lot of confidence and uh, it gave me a lot of belief because you work for it your entire life and then you beat someone like that and you're like, oh, okay, I can actually do this. And also, I loved watching her and I just love Petra. I think she's a great person and she's very uh, respectful towards everyone, which I really love about her. And um, to me, it was one of the, one of the nicest moments because I, I beat someone I admired, but still it was in a very nice and respectful way and a very fair play match. So um, that was definitely one of the most memorable ones. What is the morale like or atmosphere on the circuit is it does it allow you to develop friendships or is it really really competitive i think it depends on personalities uh, it's competitive but i personally think that now with the younger generation newer generation it's getting a bit worse in terms of um they are taught to be very competitive and you know to be in the in their circle with their team which I don't think is right because, you know, we can still help each other and we can talk to each other. It's not like, you know, it's going to affect anyone. I have a lot of really good friends from the tour. With some of them I, I meet apart from tennis. So definitely I know that um, I will keep a lot of good friendships from tennis when I finish my career. So for me personally, I just, I just think it depends what you want and on your personality, but... I'm very social and I think if, you, if you're looking for, 
for a friend and if you're looking for making a friendship, it's definitely possible everywhere, let alone on tour. But the atmosphere is getting to me more and more competitive, which I'm not a fan of, but I hope it's going to change. And I hope with age, when these girls mature, they will understand that they can be competitors on the court, but off the court, it doesn't have to be like that. We are back with Foreign Influence. I'm Alina Reddy and we're speaking with Alex Krunic, who is here in Melbourne for the Australian Open. Tennis is a very mental game. How do you prepare and most importantly, how do you stay motivated? Honestly, I'm not the best in mental preparations. I still have a lot of work to do. It's I all right, all of us have yeah. things to improve yeah, on. Yeah, definitely, yes. that's a good thing. I have a trouble switching off because, you know, I'm very often on my phone, there's too much information. And I think for me, the best matches I played, I had to switch off from everything at least an hour before my match spend time with my coach uh, just or alone but in a quiet place because uh, the, I think the the emptier your head is before everything the better because there's always an influence uh, outside uh, in the outside world it definitely helps me to just switch off from everything at least an hour before the match and I think that's what uh, most players do and how do you unwind oh well I try to spend less time in the club and on site. I think also, especially in the, at the Grand Slam, it's just too many people. So you need to go away, at least for me. So for me, that's a very important thing to just, at the end of the day, just, I don't know, go somewhere, do something you love, doesn't matter. Everyone has something uh, we love. To me, staying in the club, long hours and, uh, you know, having two practices a day, and that's definitely not, not, uh, what I like, I like to be done in the morning and uh, maybe go watch a movie or I don't know, have a nice walk. Chill out. Yeah, chill out. I like to write. Sometimes I write songs, so I, oh, you know, really? yeah. oh. so I, uh, I sit sometimes by the sea if I can or a river or whatever is around and uh, just put my mind on a paper. But I guess that's that's one of the most important things for me. That's what really switches me off. <laughs> Where does that music inspiration come from? I honestly don't know. I think probably from from my life. Um, water inspires me a lot. Uh, when I'm usually in the country where there is a sea or an ocean, that's where I just sit there and I start writing. So I think it's... I write a lot when I'm in Croatia. Croatia inspires me for some reason. What city do you spend most time in? Belgrade. Belgrade. Belgrade, even though Moscow is my first love and whenever I go there I'm home my soul is home you know mm -hmm. you know you have a city where you land and you're like okay now is I'm connected that's Moscow for me but unfortunately I cannot spend that much time there because my base is in Serbia and why how did that come about when I was 18 I wanted a change me and my coach needed a break from each other and uh, I went to Slovakia to practice and uh, after one and a half year I came back to Serbia and ever since then, uh, I was thinking to come back to Moscow, but uh, it's not easy to practice there and everything is very far. The weather is not really good for tennis. So I decided that, you know, it's, it's definitely more convenient to practice in Serbia. And then I had a Serbian team. So it just mm -hmm. happened like that, you know. And I also spend a lot of time in Split. My coach is from mm -hmm. Split and I love Split. Absolutely love yeah, Split. It's a beautiful yeah. part of the world. Yeah, yeah. is so... I what is your coach's there. name? Zudin Zunic. He uh, used to work in China for a couple of years, then he worked with Magdalinet. And I know him from tour from very long ago. And uh, we share a lot of um, similar things mental-wise. You know, he's more like a mentor to me. That's coach. important yeah. to have that relationship yeah. For me, and that's connection. Important. Yeah. yeah. If you're a tennis coach, you first of all need to be a good psychologist. At least that's what I think. And we all know forehands and backhands, but 
to get the best out of us at that given moment, you need to feel, you know, because our season is 11 months almost and it's not going to be the same day every day. So that's what I appreciate about him is that he really, he puts his ego aside and he's there for me and he's there to try to find the best way to get to me. And that's, for me, that's what matters the most. Take me through your day or your ordinary week. Like how, what, what is your schedule? I wake up around 7.30. Uh, we start at 9. Usually 9 to 12 is our practice time. It depends how I feel, but we try to make two and a half hours at least on, on court because I'm not a fan of two practices a day, so I would rather yeah. have a longer one. We obviously warm up before that. We go on court and after that I uh, do some exercises in the gym. I eat, go to physio if I need, have a massage, and I try to get out of the club unless I really want to watch a match. That's what my day looks like. I am very proud of you because you. you are an Olympian <laughs> twice. Yeah. Yeah. Most people who are Olympians, yeah. they are Olympians only once, okay. but you are very lucky yeah. and not lucky. You have worked very hard yeah. to get there. You're an Olympian twice. Yeah. What is it like to participate in the Olympics compared to Grand Slam? I would prefer Olympics to anything in the world. You know, for me, winning gold would be the, the, the top of my career, even if I never win a Grand Slam. The highest honor. Yeah, the yeah. highest honor, definitely. For me, it's like... Um, sports culture that I'm in, for me, it's the highest. Uh, and everybody cheering for yeah. one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's like the, 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 the top of the iceberg for me to, to win an Olympic medal. So um, it's definitely something I enjoyed enormously. And uh, my first uh, Olympics in Rio was unforgettable. You know, I was like a kid in, in the Disneyland uh, watching all, all the athletes, taking a picture with Usain Bolt, of course, it was a classic eating uh, in the same place with everyone, then watching them on a the TV in different sports. It's, to me, it's, it's an unbelievable experience. I cannot compare, compare it to, to anything. And then having a chance to compete again in Tokyo uh, with me uh, being a huge fan of Japan and uh, being there at the Olympics, obviously it was a bit different because it was COVID and there was a lot of restrictions. How, how was it different? We had In to get ways? tested every day. We got tested every day. Uh, we had to obviously be in masks and, you know, be socially distanced. We had this glass uh, separators in, in the restaurant and everything. But how about the supporters? There wasn't any. Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, no, it was yeah. televised and there were yeah, a lot of supporters yeah, of course, yeah, watching yeah. television yeah. and cheering for you. Definitely. Yeah. But yeah, there was no crowd, yeah. at least in tennis, and there was no crowd in the opening. Opening was much different to, to Rio. I'm sure, I mean, in Japan, they did everything they could, but they were very restricted. So that was something that took away this Olympic feeling a bit, that uh, I will attend or make one more, uh, at least... Um, one more Olympic, I hope. Who that was in the team this time around, in the tennis team at the Olympics? It was me, Nina Stojanovic. We played uh, doubles. She played singles. And Jorovic, Ivana Jorovic, she played singles with her protected ranking. It was Kitsmanovic and Novak. Well, thank you so much for thank our you. lovely chat. Thank we you. wish you all the best. Thanks. And uh, we... I'm looking forward to cheer for you Thank the you. Australian Open I'm and other tournaments. Thanks. I'm looking forward to your support. It's well needed. Thank you, guys.